Hey everyone, this is Professor Ellis and I'd like to welcome you back to Specialized Communications for Technology Students. This is English 1133 OL96 Fall 2021 and we are now in week three. Uh, now that we've got uh, this short break uh, behind us you know, for the various holidays, um, we'll be able to move ahead with the semester uh, having a lecture each week um, and obviously the pace of the class will pick up as a result of that. Um, so before we get into today's lecture, uh, we're reviewing what we did last week, make sure everybody remembers, uh, and then talking about what you need to begin doing for week three. I uh, just want to remind you how important it is that you're keeping up with the video lectures, uh, that that is the class component of our class. Um, I think it's it can be easy for some folks to think that it's not as important because Professor Ellis will write up some of the stuff on Open Lab. But remember, everything that I put on Open Lab uh, is primarily a supplement to the things that I talk about during the lecture. Um, if you're not watching the video lectures, it's like you're just missing class and you're not there. Um, so you need to make sure that you spend time watching the lecture, making notes, as I've talked about before. Uh, you know, I recommended the Cornell method to help you with that. Um, but it's important not only to watch the lectures, but to be engaged with them, to be, act, to be an active listener, one in which you're paying attention to what I talk about, you know, follow along the examples that I show you, and that you make notes in your notebook as a reminder, uh, so you're not having to go back to the videos and like skip through and try to find things that I might have spoken about before. Um, try to get as much value out of those lectures as possible on just you know, one, on one viewing. But of course, they are there. Um, they're going to be on YouTube. You know, I've embedded them in our Open Lab class, so you'll be able to you know, catch up with them anytime that you want. And so, even if you don't have time to watch the whole lecture at once, which I'm not saying you have to do that, you can divide it up if you like. Um, but you want to make sure you do watch the entire lecture video and get all the value that you can out of each of the lectures. Because um, I mean, I put a lot into them and do a lot of planning to make sure that they are of the quality and have the information that you need to be successful. Because ultimately that's what I'm concerned about is that everybody in the class um, is successful with learning the material and can use the material that, that you've learned outside of our class. Because um, everything that we do in our class isn't something just you, you do for the class for the benefit of giving, getting a grade. Everything in the class is very pragmatic, it's very practical. Uh, so that it's something that helps you make your entrance into the workplace, that you can apply these things into a workplace setting or into uh, even some of your other classes when we talk about the other types of deliverables that you do, um, that you'll create in the class. So that being said, uh, let's go ahead and get into um, today's class. Oh, one other thing I just want to remind you of. Um, is make sure that you do remember uh, how to get in touch with me. I have heard from some folks um, over email. In my other class, I did have folks come to my office hours, which if you remember, even though we didn't have class the past two weeks, I did hold my office hours. Uh, again, that was something that I did on my own just as an extra benefit to you all, because uh, I want to make sure that with this being an asynchronous class, that you have every opportunity to talk to me if you do have questions about anything relating to the class. Um, so my office hours again are on Wednesdays 3 to 5. There's a link on the syllabus as well as over on the left hand menu bar of our Open Lab site. Um, just to show you. Yeah, so here's our Open Lab site. You can see right over here on the left, Google Hangouts. Just click that and that'll uh, launch you into uh, my weekly office hours. And if you can't uh, me during that time you can also send me an email uh, my email address is jellis at citytech.cuny.edu uh, you can ask me a question just via email or if you want to meet outside of office hours let me know your availability for like the next seven days so that I'll be able to find a time in my schedule which just to be honest with you is a lot busier now that, that the semester is well underway uh, than it was at the beginning so give me a, a, all your availability so I can find some time where our schedules are able to meet and then I'll let you know when that is and we'll uh, get together over uh, Google Hangouts to talk. Uh, Alright, so 
getting back into the class. So for this week, I just want to briefly uh, review some things. Uh, so in week two, uh, we talked about project one uh, with the job application uh, portfolio. I did an overview of that. So if you didn't watch the whole thing, go back and watch that so that you understand all the components that are going to go into the project. Um, that you have the two resumes, you have the letter of application, and you have the LinkedIn.com portfolio. Now, for today's class, I'd ask you for the weekly writing assignment to do job market research. Uh, one student in the class pointed out that I forgot to tell you how long that should be. I don't want the weekly writing assignments to be too onerous, okay, meaning too hard. Um, the purpose of them is for you to do work that relates to the projects in the class while getting some writing and research practice. Um, so I, if you've gone back and looked at our open lab site, you'll see that I added that it should be at least 250 words for that weekly writing assignment. Um, that's basically one page double spaced. Uh, it can be longer than that. I encourage you to write as much as you can uh, unless I give you some really hard parameters. Uh, for the assignment. Um, but for the weekly writing assignments, um, by and large, you can write as much as you want as long as you're meeting the minimums. Because the way I grade those is on best effort. If I see that you're doing the work, that you listen to what I ask you to do, that you've really taken in the spirit of what the assignment is, you get full credit. Uh, I'm not going to go through the weekly writing assignments and try to nickel and dime you on like small errors because the weekly writing assignments are meant to you give you an opportunity to do more writing, to do a little research that's relevant uh, to what you're learning and what we're doing in the class. Um, now with the large projects, that is something where I'm going to be a lot more critical and a lot more um, focused on evaluating the work that you give me because it's not just that you've got the one shot to do it, you've got a lot of time for each of the major projects to work on them. I'm going to give you time for peer review with the other folks in the class so you can get feedback to make sure they're as polished and perfect as you can make them before you send them to me. Um, so the, the stakes on those are going to be a lot higher than they are for the weekly writing assignments. So don't, don't stress out about the weekly writing assignments. Just give them your best effort uh, and you'll be able to get that credit that you earn from doing them. Let's see, I uh, also mentioned um, the job search advice uh, open lab project site I built and you can always use this as a resource during this part of the semester in our class. There's a lot of valuable stuff here and we're going to be looking at some of these sample documents today and I'll be replicating those these links as well as the links for your uh, for these resume helpers uh, sites uh, on our open lab site, so they'll be you'll be seeing them in actually multiple places. But the job search advice site is always available, uh, whether you're you're taking my class right now or whenever you're out of my class and taking other classes uh, at City Tech. Now, the homework that I asked you to do for today's class, which is going to feed into the first part of the job application portfolio project with the resumes, was to create a document with all of your job relevant information. And it, it's absolutely imperative that you do that. That document, and not just for the purposes of our class, but that document makes everything about the job search so much easier for you in the long run. Because, as I said in our last lecture, the, that document is kind of like a database for you. It includes all the information about your education, about the different jobs you've worked, uh, who, you know, what were the addresses, what was the phone numbers, who was your manager, what types of um, responsibilities did you have at those jobs, uh, what classes did you take at City Tech, uh, what volunteer work did you do, um, what special skills and hobbies, languages, all the things about you that are relevant to you being able to get a job should be in that document. And you should update that document as you move through life. I'm not saying you have to do it like every day or every week, but you know, every quarter, every six months, every year, you should go back to that document and make sure it's updated because you never know what's going to happen. You might you get laid off. 
you might find that you hear about a new opportunity you would like to apply for and by having that document in front of you it makes writing a new resume writing a job letter filling out application materials so much easier and faster for you and also accurate so that you're not like having to um, try to rack your mind about when you work somewhere or what a manager's name was or their email address or phone number it's all right there you can fill out things out quick and you can get your applications in as quickly as possible and as painlessly as possible so if you're still trying to catch up I know some folks in the class said that they were take this opportunity to do it um, one of the things that you'll find with the way that I run the class is that obviously we have deadlines but I also recognize that because of the way things are right now that some folks may need a little extra time on things it doesn't mean that if you turn something in late that you are going to get all the credit you might get a slightly lower grade because you've obviously taken more time than someone that did everything on time the way that, that, that I asked them to but I do want to give you that opportunity to do your best and if you're not happy with the grade that you receive on something, the thing that I do give folks an opportunity to do is to revise their work and resubmit it again before the end of the, uh, end of the semester. Uh, and I'll reevaluate your work and you can get some of those points back up. Um, and the reason for that, not just to try to make things as amenable to the, the strange world that we find ourselves in now, but that's actually incorporating the writing process into the kind of work that we're doing and you, you know the writing process which you should have encountered in your other uh, English and writing classes is that you know, primarily you draft something you receive feedback you revise it and resubmit right and then you get more feedback and then you revise it and then you send it back out and then you keep going in this cycle trying to make things better better and better and what you'll find is that can serve as a heuristic a heuristic and again this is something for your notes a heuristic is a shortcut. It's something that you've learned from experience how to do in one situation, but you think, you know, I can do this same thing in this slightly different situation. And so this process for um, the writing process where you create and get feedback, revise, uh, send back out for more feedback, etc., is something that also you can, you can incorporate into different types of workflows for all sorts of different things that you do in the workplace. And also it points the way towards the kind of work that you're gonna be doing in the workplace, which is very collaborative. When you have to imagine when you're asking people for feedback on your work, it's not like you're writing this stuff alone. You're getting their feedback and the expectation is you're going to be incorporating the best of that in the writing that you do. Because in the workplace, it's not so much you, know, you as an author uh, writing the great American novel, no, you're creating writing that is going to be representing the company at which you work or the organization that you work at and rep are representing, um, in which case everything is quite collaborative. You'll be working on teams with people uh, to create the types of deliverables, meaning the documents uh, that are required of you. And so it's important to kind of get used to that process now, and that's why we incorporate a lot of this into the different types of writing classes and um, technical writing classes we have at City Tech uh, to get you prepared, to make you comfortable with this mode before you get into the workplace where it is just the de facto mode um, for any kind of cooperative um, writing or um, product development, etc. All right, uh, one last thing, uh, I'll just remind you again about that document that you should create for all your job relevant information. Again, look back at, at week two to, to hear me talk about that more. But again, it's really helpful to have that because it makes everything just copy and paste. Um, as we'll look at the resumes today, if you have that document open of all your relevant uh, job search information about yourself, you can just copy and paste stuff and edit it as necessary in those documents like your resumes, your job application letter, etc. Um, so I think this kind of gives us an overview of where we've been with week two. Uh, and you'll find that with our class I try to do this so that you can see the continuity between what we're doing throughout the semester. Uh, because with this being asynchronous class it can be very easy to get lost um, 
from from one uh, lecture to the next and so I want to try to make sure that I'm providing you with uh, that background with a context with references to everything that we've done uh, in the class to make it as clear to you of the progress uh, that we're making through the semester and if any point like you do find yourself getting lost or you have a question about what we're working on or how it relates to other things in the class again that's why you can come to office hours that's why you can email me and I'll get right back to you because with us not meeting in person these other modes of interacting email and office hours are absolutely important for your success so I don't want you to suffer in silence you, I don't want anybody to think that they can't reach out to me because obviously I am here for you. I want to make sure you're successful, but uh, I you know, can't peer into what struggles you might be having. So you always let keep me in the loop about that uh, and ask me those questions. Uh, and we'll work together to make sure we keep you on track. So that brings us to week three. And before we talk about resumes, which is going to be the main topic for this week's lecture, uh, I want us to just take a look ahead. So make sure you put this into your notes. Uh, and we will also look over at the class syllabus to look at these dates. So this is looking ahead. So today's class is week three, Wednesday, September 22nd. And I'm going to be talking about what extra readings, actually going to be some videos that you're going to watch um, through a resource you can get through the Newark Public Library. Uh, so everything, you, as I've said before in the class, is free. Uh, I try to find high quality stuff that you can have access to without having to pay for any of it. Um, so that'll be what we're working on for this week to help prepare you for other parts of the job application project. Now, this week we're going to talk about resumes. Next week, we're going to take a look at the job application letter and the LinkedIn.com profile. So that's the other half of the job application portfolio. Then in week five, we're going to do peer review. And I'll explain when we get to week five how we'll do that using email and doing reply all to an email that I will send to everyone in the class. Um, we're fortunate to have a small class this semester so everyone will be able to uh, participate as essentially one large group uh, rather than having several smaller groups if we had more students in the class. Um, so week five I'll explain how we're going to be doing that peer review so you get feedback on these documents that you're creating, the resumes, two resumes, and the job application letter and your LinkedIn.com profile. Um, and then in week six I will show you how to submit your uh, job application portfolio. Um, so you, it won't be due week six, it's actually going to all come due on October 20th, which is, you know, I show you how to turn in October 13th, and then the expectation is you turn everything in by October 20th. Um, but you should be looking ahead to this date on October 6th, uh, because I will be showing you how to do peer review. So you need to have your, all your documents ready by that point. So at, you know, we got time right now, with it being September 22nd, for you to be working on your resumes. For September 29th, you're going to be writing your job application letter and you're creating that LinkedIn.com profile. And so if you keep up with that work, which I don't think is too onerous, uh, you're going to be doing fine so that you'll have you know, a draft you know, it won't be the final thing but you'll have a draft of all those documents ready by October 6 so that week we can do peer review and then the week after you'll have time to take that feedback revise those documents and your LinkedIn.com profile and then submit everything by October 20th so I think we're, we're doing really great with the time right now and I think we can keep up with that schedule. Uh, but again, if anybody has questions about this as we get go through it, make sure you reach out to me. Now, in the last lecture, I showed you an overview of the different types of documents 
that we'll be creating for the job application portfolio. Yeah, resume basics. I went over all this before. Um, just to hit some of the highlights before we take a look at um, some of the, the, basic, the basics of these documents. Uh, each of your resumes, because at this point in your career, you're, you're just starting out, at least in the careers that you're preparing for um, with these degrees from City Tech. I know some folks uh, in, in this class and in my other classes you know, have had other careers, which that's great. Uh, but the thing to keep in mind when you're entering a, a, a new career path is that you want to customize your resumes for the jobs that you're applying for. Um, that you want to keep in mind that both your resumes, both of them that you have, uh, that I'm going to ask you to create, and your job application letter, or what's otherwise called a cover letter, needs to be customized as much as possible for the types of jobs you're applying for. Um, so for example, um, one student uh, in the class reached out about you know, having had you know a previous career in finance, which I mean is terrific, it's amazing. Um, but now this student is transitioning to uh, a CIS um, career path, and so the the type of resume that person would have used for finance um, is not going to be tailored in the right way to get them an in to a CIS position. Um, there will be elements that they'll want to carry over, for example, like previous work experience, but some of the skills are going to be quite different uh, in, the different, in these two different career paths that we're talking about. So you need to be aware of the type of job you're applying for, the field that that job is set in, and then also some of the specifics about the job listing, which is why this past week I asked you to do that research so that when you're looking at the different job ads, you're actually learning from them. That reading of job ads is the same kind of thing that happens when you're, like, say, reading a book about microelectronics or reading a book about uh, servoelectric mechanisms. All of these things where you learn by reading and, and, and seeing how other people have done things is exactly the same as whenever you're reading job applications, or I mean not applications, but job ads. Because there's a language that's used, there are requirements that are asked for, there's terminology uh, that are very specific to that domain of you know, the IT or the, the technical job search. So the idea is that by reading these job ads, you're actually going to be learning something about how to write your resumes, how to write your cover letters based on what is being asked for in the job ads. And so even though I asked for the weekly writing assignment that you look at you know, roughly 10 different job ads and then write about your observations of them. What were key words that kept being used? What patterns did you see? Were there certain qualifications that kept getting asked for for those jobs? Well, those kinds of observations can help you tailor yourself, both in terms of like how to write your documents, but also to make you aware if there are certain qualifications you need, like maybe a certification uh, that you're not getting just because you're getting the degree. Uh, in some fields, certifications are an important part of being able to demonstrate you have certain knowledges and training and experience uh, because a lot of certifications aren't just about like you passing a test. They also involve like say passing a test and having a certain number of years of experience in the field. And so if you, t you might be able to pass the test for one cert, but until you get those years of experience, you can't actually get the certification that you need. Um, so these types of things take planning on your part to be prepared to get that when the time is right um, for your advancement in your career to apply for the types of jobs that you want. And so even though I asked you to just do this very brief 
reading of job ads on like say monster.com or indeed.com or on linkedin.com that's something you should begin doing a lot more on your own even once you're you've landed a job in the career that you want is that you want to keep up with the field because as time goes by there's going to be new advances uh, new types of certifications and you need to be aware of what those things are because again you don't know the future you could get laid off you might want to switch into a different kind of company or different uh, you know, job title and so it's absolutely important you know what you need in order to make those changes whether it be forced on you or something you decide to do on your own uh, if you're not doing this work along and along you're essentially you're putting yourself at a disadvantage compared to those people that are because I assure you there are a lot of people that are quite tuned in to what's going on in the job market for the field the fields that you're going into now because you're just starting out um, the type of resume you want to aim for is one page maximum and again resumes um, that are longer than a page more than likely aren't going to be looked at or studied as intently you want to fit what's important about yourself and what's important about yourself for the job you're applying for in that one page as best as possible you don't want to use any fancy templates the templates that I give you are very bare bones they have a good layout to fit information in uh, in a, as compact a space as possible but in an easy to read way because you could just have like a big wall of text but then if the wall of text is hard to read then that's also going to be to your disadvantage you need to make sure it's a easy to read document that you create for your resume uh, and you want to really follow the principle of keep it simple and stupid you use one type of font one font family um, you don't use a lot of different sizes you just use size to um, signal to the reader uh, the different um, headings the different sections of your document uh, not doing anything crazier than that um, and you should have as I say here uh, in the background a strong go-to resume meaning one that's like like a general fit for any job you might apply for in your field but for those jobs you really want you need to customize them again you're being accurate and ethical I mean I'm, I'm not saying in any way to like put anything that's false into your resumes but you want to pick and choose from that long database of all your qualifications that you created this past week you want to pick and choose amongst all these things what is the most relevant what is the most impactful what's the most significant and important aspects of yourself and your experience that make you a good candidate for those specific top 10 jobs um, that requires a lot of work I'm not saying it's easy but it's that kind of effort that you can put into the job search that might yield you better results than if you just go with the one go-to resume for everything so I mean again the idea is to be as successful as possible with the time and energy that you have available so of course you're going to have to prioritize prioritize some things over others uh, but do what you can uh, to give yourself the best chance of success now for this uh, project I want you to make two different types of resumes and these will be two basically go-to resumes that you can customize further later but for the time being they're going to be a way that you have two resumes ready to use right now whether it be for a job or for an internship um, that highlights what you're capable of doing now the first one we'll talk about is the skills focused resume excuse me the skills focused resume is one that's really great for entry-level positions because it foregrounds what skills you have and see those skills you have are primarily going to come from your classes that you've taken uh, some could be like from an internship um, maybe you know a part-time job you might have but you might not yet have a lot of practical work experience in the field so the skills focused resume allows you just to focus on what you can do and offer to the company you're applying for and the thing to keep in mind with all of this 
is that when you're applying for these jobs, you never want to, and I'll talk more about this when we look at the job application letter, the cover letter next week, is you never want to, to talk about like what that company is gonna do for you. Because as far as the company is concerned, they don't care, right? What they are concerned about is getting an employee that can fulfill certain tasks that add value to their company. Uh, so you don't ever want to like dwell on like, oh, this will be a great experience for me if I get this job, I'll learn so much. No, you want to be able to say, these are the things that I can do for your company. I'll be able to do them better, more efficiently, uh, at a higher standard than anybody else that's gonna apply for this job. And here's all the reasons why. And your resume and your cover letter are going to back up that argument that you make. Uh, that's the kind of thing that's gonna get you noticed uh, and get your foot in the door in a career. Now, one thing though I'll note is that when you're applying for an internship, it's a little bit different. In an internship application, you can talk a little bit about how the learning experience of being in that internship is going to help you move along your path toward a career. You want to balance being able to say, I can do all these things that I've learned in my classes and maybe from other work experience as an intern at your company, but also being uh, you know, a recipient of this internship is going to help me learn X, Y, and Z uh, from your company. So you're basically saying, I'm going to do all this for you and in exchange, essentially, I'm going to be gaining this experience and knowledge from your workplace. Um, that's an internship, because an internship is something that's temporary. It's meant to be a learning experience, but you also, in order to get it, need to be able to show you have certain skills that they need for an intern, intern to have, right? So that's why I say with an internship, it's more of a balance. But whenever you're applying for an actual job, you don't want to go anywhere near like what you're getting out of the bargain, uh, at least as far as the resume and job letter are concerned. It, it could theoretically be something that comes up during an interview, um, but as far as your documents are concerned, you're really trying to show how you're the right fit for a position that they're advertising for. Uh, all right, so skills Focus resume emphasizes what you know and can do. And now we'll also have you make an experience focus resume. This is the more traditional type resume where you list uh, all the different jobs you've had and what, you, what responsibilities or skills you had uh, from those specific positions. Um, and so it's good to have that, but again, because you may not have a lot of experience that is in your field yet, that may not be the type of resume you want to lead with uh, at this point in your career. Some folks may already have practical work experience um, uh, in your field already, in which case that's great. That may be the kind of resume you want to use, the experience focused one, uh, because you have that advantage. But if you don't have that advantage yet, you're just trying to get your foot in the door, the skills focused resume is likely the better way to go at this point. All right, so why don't we take a look at these. So these are going to be sample resumes that I give you links to. These are ones that I've made for students in the past. And uh, they include a lot of information uh, for each of the types of resumes. And they show the, essentially the same information, but in slightly different ways. Okay, So this is the skills resume that we're going to look at first, and then this is going to be the experience resume that we look at second okay you can see there's slight variation in the way the information is organized all right so this is the again the skills based resume first so with these resumes again they need to be one page you need to fit everything within the page in an easy to print format which means that for most printers uh, you want to leave at least half inch margins on all sides at, at a minimum. Uh, some printers don't like having to go further or you know, less than half inch because they can't print over here, especially laser printers, a lot of laser printers. So leave at least half an inch margins all the way around. 
Now you can see I used the size of the same type font through, uh, in the document in order to show off different important parts. I wanted the name of the person who's represented on this resume uh, to be the, the biggest font used on the page. So that way, whoever looks at this resume immediately, bam, knows this is George P. Burdell. Um, and you can look him up on Wikipedia and find out who, who that is. Um, now, George P. Burdell, he, he's included his address here. He's included a phone number, and you see he uh, noted that this is a cell phone number. Because like, if you have multiple phone numbers, you can say like you have a home phone number and you have a cell phone number. Uh, that's perfectly okay to, to do. And then he also included his email. And what you can do with your email, as I said in our last class, you definitely want to use your City Tech email address. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, but the most important is that it proves that you were, that you are or were a student at City Tech. Because um, you can imagine a lot of people there, I mean, I, I don't know the actual numbers, but there are people that will be disingenuous with their resumes and applying for certain jobs. And it's useful to you to, to include some evidence that you have, say, the degree that, that you make claims to on your resume. And one of the easiest ways to do that is simply use your school email address. Also, there's a certain professionalism that's reflected by you using your school email address as opposed to an email address at rando.com. Um, also, considering the types of email accounts you might have that you might have had for some years, um, certain email domain names can actually be looked down upon, especially in the computer fields. Um, like it's one thing to have a Gmail account, which is you know, widely you know, accepted, but to apply for an IT job and have a hotmail.com account, it's either you know, looks very bad on you or it shows that you have some weird sense of irony uh, because you hotmail uh, is, you in the past anyways, was a notoriously unsafe email account to have easily hacked back in the day. Um, not professional at all. Uh, same with like a yahoo.com email address. Now, I'm not saying anything you know, from my perspective about these companies. What I'm saying is how they might be perceived by a hiring manager. Uh, I want you to have the best chance of you getting your foot in the door, so I'm telling you that it's best to go with using a professional email address, whether it be your school, if uh, by chance you have like your own domain name, uh, because you have like an, you've, you have an online presence that you've created, uh, like an online portfolio or something you can use your own domain name uh, if it, you have an MX server or it has mail forwarding built into it. Um, that, that also will be fine, but I think the very best thing that you can use at this point would be your school email address, at least for your first job uh, applications that you're putting out just to begin your career. Now the next part of this is the objective statement. Now you'll find a lot of textbooks and a lot of people online say that the objective statement is not as important now as it was in the past. But because so many people are not using it, I think that a well-crafted objective statement actually can make you stand out amongst applicants more so than it, than it would have, like say, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Now, what I mean by a carefully crafted objective statement is that you don't want an objective statement that is too general. You want to make sure that it is broad enough for the types of jobs you're applying for, but also signal some awareness for the type of job and the company that you're applying uh, for a job at. So in this case, the objective statement I wrote for George P. Burdell is to plan, create, and manage technical writing needs within a team and an enterprise IT firm. So here I'm, I'm loading this up with some very important words like planning, creating, managing. Uh, so it shows like this person has some initiative, not just to create things, but also to, to be a leader in the, in, in the organization. The type of work that's involved, technical writing, uh, 
within a team, so saying they're a team player, that's good. But here's where we get into specifics. I said an enterprise IT firm. I could have said at a IT startup. I could have said at um, uh, maybe um, a governmental institution or a nonprofit. Um, I'm putting what is relevant to the types of jobs that George P. Burdell is going to apply for. And you should do the same thing. And you need to be mindful of the types of you know, companies you want to apply for. What kind of company is it? Uh, and then include that kind of specificity in your objective statement. Now, with the objective, you don't need to be so specific that you say the name of the company um, because they know that you're applying to other places. I mean, any sane person would. So you don't need to be that specific here in the resume. That's something we'll say for the job application letter, the cover letter in next week's lecture. Now this next part is where it comes in that we call this a skills resume. You notice that I'm putting higher up and in a lot, lar lar a lot larger section of the document, skills and accomplishments. And for this resume, I divided it into four different subsections. You can use different subsections of your own. And I'm going to give you uh, links that, that include different types of section names that you can use for this. Um, but I chose management, innovation, design and layout, and technical expertise, things that I thought were relevant for someone that's going into technical writing that has aspirations to managing a team. Um, now, under the management section, you notice that I'm not including the subject in any of these sentences. I'm not saying I led a team of four technical communication undergraduates. You can leave out the subject in your statements on your resume because it saves space and it's also kind of redundant. The resume represents you, nobody else. So you need to only talk about things that you know how to do. You only talk about the experiences that you've had. So you can leave off saying I, because whoever's reading your resume will know that the I is understood. So I can just say led, past tense, a team of four technical communication undergraduates to edit a technical report for the nonprofit computer recycling initiative, test it with in-person and online audiences, and revise it for publication. So here I'm talking about you know, an educational experience that George P. Burdell had. Um, and you can say something similar about a project that you had a hand in if you wanted to include some sort of leadership position um, that you've had uh, at, you know, in your educational experience, but not workplace experience. Innovation. Uh, here uh, I wrote proposed and implemented a series of HTML based virtual applications for Mac OS 7.5 and 8.0 with a focus on internet client programs. Um, this is something that I did back when I worked at MindSpring. Um, but again, you know, I'm not including an I and I'm saying like propose. So the propose that relates to plan, right? and then implemented that relates to create i'm using different words that mean the same thing but that variety of words actually shows that i'm you it shows and reflects something about your communication skills your writing skills that you're good at diction meaning that you have good word choice um, and that's going to be something obviously that you can do in the writing that you you perform for whatever company that you work at but if you were to like keep recycling and reusing the same words throughout every sentence you write in the resume, that's probably not going to look as good, right? So again, everything about the resume needs to be something you think about in terms of reflecting the best things about you and what you're capable of doing. Uh, next, design and layout. Created an online museum of Jurassic technology selected from the projects of 20 undergraduate students. So again, this is something that I did as an undergraduate at Georgia Tech, um, but it, it's something that was something I learned in school, it's something that I did in a class, but here I'm talking about how this relates to design and layout skills that you, I'll be able to draw on 
in the workplace. Uh, then finally, technical expertise. Expert in digital writing tools, including Microsoft Word, HTML, XML, and Markup. Um, so you can include words that signal your level of ability in the different types of, say, digital tools, or even like if you want to talk about languages that you know, um, because you need to kind of signal how good you are at them. Now, you don't want to say expert unless you actually consider yourself an expert in those things. You could also say that um, you're, you are capable, that you are intermediate, that you are a novice, meaning you're starting, but you know a little bit. Um, but obviously, the more you know about certain things, those things you want to put first, and then things that you are less good at, you put later. So this first sentence here is expert. The second sen sentence is intermediate in photo editing and design tools, including Adobe Creative Suite. And then the lowest here, familiar with online content publishing with WordPress. And if you remember from the first lecture, that gets back to our class, is that I want us to use OpenLab so you all have more experience using WordPress, which OpenLab is based on. So already you can include this sentence because of the work that we're doing in our class on your resume, that you're familiar with it. Now you may have more experience in it than what we're doing in OpenLab, in which case you can include that too. Um, but at least that much is going to come from our class, and you can include that uh, as being familiar with online content publishing or WordPress. Now you see how big this part of the document is. And then smaller, I have a little section for employment history because again, this is a skills resume. It emphasizes skills over my work experience because you know, technical support, sales representative, those are not things that are gonna look as, not impressive, but as relevant to this kind of job position. So I wanted this to be small, right? Now, it doesn't mean I want to leave it off. You need to include a, a full work history uh, when you apply for a job, but you don't need it to take up too much space if it isn't relevant. Uh, similarly with education, you know, I included what my uh, degree title is, Bachelor of Science in Professional and Technical Writing. I give the full proper name of the college, New York City College of Technology. I give the month and year of the graduation date and then I also included a line uh, for the specialization. So many degrees at City Tech have a specialization. You need to include that on your resume, uh, you know, whatever it is that you've selected. Um, if you don't have, like if your particular degree doesn't have a specialization, that's fine. You don't include it. But if you have that, you want to include that as a part of your resume. Uh, now, another thing to consider is that if you know, whatever field you're going into, there's going to be professional societies and you need to join whichever one is relevant for your field. For those of you that are in the professional and technical writing program, you need to find out about the Society for Technical Communication, STS.org. You should go ahead and join that now. Uh, they have lower rates. It's something you have to pay for on a yearly basis, but it, it's something that has lower rates for students. Um, and they have programs that pro you know, provide uh, training, uh, they have speaker events, they have networking opportunities to help you get jobs and meet people in the, the local field. Um, so they're vitally important to help helping you get your foot in the door. And it's actually something you can contribute to and be a part of the longer you're in your career. Um, like some students uh, from City Tech that are, that are already members of STS, have gone on to become like members, like elected members of um, the um, executive council of the, the New York chapter of STS. So there's a lot of things that you can not only gain experience from, but again, that's something you can then put on a resume that you've had this professional leadership position that you were elected to by other professionals in the field. That looks really great for you because it shows that people that are had the same training and backgrounds as you think you are respectful enough and you know, the right candidate for these special types of roles. So you, you definitely want to look into that as being a way to, to gain extra types of experience and accolades for um, you know, your resume and for your career advancement. 
Now the last parts of this uh, skills resume, I included a section for special qualifications and honors. Uh, so in this case, I said you know, fluent in French and Latin. You could say like native, um, uh, native fluency in in whatever other languages you might ha might know. Um, if you have higher proficiency in one language but lower in another, you need to specify that. Uh, but any language that you know, and it doesn't matter, like even even if it's you know a Creole, if it's anything involving language you should include it on your resume because that uh, is something that can you know, make you an, a really stellar candidate for some jobs uh, and also shows that you simply you know, know more language skills than someone that doesn't have those language uh, abilities uh, you can also include things that might that aren't you know, completely relevant but show that you have a, an investment in the field that you're applying for a job in. So this is a I'm uh, wanting to get a job in an I, you know enterprise IT firm. Doesn't mean I'm going to be in this case a computer overclocker professionally, but it shows obviously that I like tinkering with computers that that where George P. Burdell does. And so that something in itself can like just make you more distinguished uh, than if you were to like say uh, that you just you like if you were to say something like weekend. Uh, tennis enthusiast. That, that's cool, but it, it might not be something that gets noticed as much as saying that you are a hobbyist in the computer field, for example. Uh, in any th kind of accolade or achievement that you've had um, that can reflect positively on you, include here. So like I put that George P. Riddell is an Eagle Scout. And there's a lot of ideas behind that that put George P. Burdell in a very positive light because to be an Eagle Scout you have to progress over years in the Boy Scout organization. Uh, you have to not only be focused on developing you know, a sense of self of like you know, learning new things but also being able to work well with others, to, to teach things to other people, to do volunteer work in a community. It shows in many ways that there's there's positive attributes to the person. So if you got anything like that, um, you know, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Explorers, other community organizations, uh, religious you know types of organizations, include those as well because those can be things that the interviewer might know about, or it might be something if you get an interview they may ask you about, and then it gives you an opportunity to say how awesome you are and all the cool things that you've done. Um, so include those types of things as well. And as I mentioned in our last lecture, you should always include your three references on your resume um, at the bottom. Um, you could divide it, as I've done here, into three cells. Like this is a table and I divided this uh, cell into three uh, and put them at the bottom. Or you could have them as you know, three separate lines going um, you know, horizontally across the page. Um, Either way is fine, but the idea is by putting the references on the resume, it saves whoever might be calling you for an interview a little bit of work. And if you save them work, that means that your application can progress through their process more quickly. They don't have to reach out to you again to, to ask for these things. Uh, and it might make them just a little bit happier. And anything that makes a hiring manager happy, in my opinion, is a good thing because that reflects good on you. So I would recommend including these things here, even if in the application process they may ask you to type them in in like an online job application. But that's not a big deal because you've already made that big um, job application database about yourself that I asked you to do last week. You already got all your references listed there. Copy and paste, copy and paste. You already got it done. It makes it so much easier. And as I mentioned before, make sure you have you good rapport, you keep in touch with these people that you ask for references. Uh, you should get to know your professors in your in your field classes. Uh, professors you may have had great experiences with even if they're not in your field. Um, past managers, uh, maybe an internship supervisor. Uh, and you can also include you know, at the beginning of your um, career uh, people that can speak to you as a reference for your character, like here I, I gave like a pastor as being like a reference, 
as you get further in your career, you're going to meet more people who can speak about the specifics of what you can do in the workplace. And that's obviously much stronger as a reference than having uh, people that can act as a character reference. Um, but nevertheless, you want to at least include three references. And if you need one of those references to be a character reference, it's better than, than not having three at all. Um, so you know, make sure you talk to people that you're going to include in your references and let them know like what kind of jobs you're applying for so that they can know to expect emails or phone calls from your strange numbers uh, so that they'll pick up and they'll be able to say really nice things about you. And again, when you ask for someone to serve as a reference for you, you want to ask them, can you serve as a strong reference for me? Uh, because that's a good indicator whether you should use them as a reference or not. Because if they can't um, commit to being a strong reference, you probably need to find another reference. Because you want people that are going to speak very highly of you, that know about you, that know the quality of your work or you know the quality of your character, um, so that they can say some really nice things about you. But someone that doesn't know you as well, can't say as many nice things, well, that's not really a, re you know, a great reference other than the fact that maybe they can attest to the fact that you were in a class, that you worked on a team, etc. So this is the sample skills resume. And now I don't want anybody to like freak out if you don't have like a whole lot of these types of, you know, projects to, to speak about. Um, you'll be able to see from the documents that I linked to um, on, on this, this week on Open Lab to give you more ideas about the different headings that you can use and what you might you have from your life experience that you can talk about in those things. Um, and even if you don't have like really stellar stuff right now that you can include, include what you can. Uh, because again, this is just so that you get some practice with, with creating these, these documents. And then when the time comes for you to be applying for these jobs, you will hopefully have more experiences that you can include that are more relevant, that are more impactful um, at that time. So I don't want anybody to freak out if you don't have like really great stuff to write about. Write about what you can. And again, it needs to be truthful, it needs to be ethical, um, but just write about what you can. Uh, for because I'm not going to be grading this on whether like uh, you you have the the best types of uh, you lived in, in educational experiences at this point. I just want to see that you're working with what you have as best as possible. Now let's take a look at the second type of resume, an experience resume. Now, one thing you'll notice about both of these resumes that, that I've created as, as samples for, for you all, they're very plain Jane in terms of their layout. Um, but they do have uh, a design, each being a little different, that's meant to help guide the eye to make them easily readable by someone at a glance. But also, as I mentioned in our last lecture, most of your job application documents are going to be read by computers before they're read by an individual person. And as a result, you don't want to be using some really whacked out, fancy um, resume template that's built into Microsoft Word that's got a lot of background graphics, uh, weird designs, um, text following a curve, all of those things, they look fancy but they will cause like you know, a computer OCR program to um, flip out and you don't want that. You want to make sure that a computer can read your document just as easily as a person can. So simple is actually a lot better uh, to making sure that your documents are read accurately because those OCR programs that look at your resumes and job application letters before a human does essentially takes all the information in your document and will use that information to populate a database that the hiring manager will have access to. So the hiring manager may not even actually look at the real resume document that you designed. They're going to have it all reformatted into like a standard you know, database template that their company has created where the computer OCR software 
pulls out your name, pulls out your address, pulls out your objective, education, etc., and then populates those fields in a standardized database form. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're making your document as easy to read both for a human being as well as a computer. Now, everything at the top is the same as before. Name, super big. Make sure it's easily readable. Uh, include all your contact information. Use your school email address. You see I use this horizontal line to separate the name block from the rest of the resume. Um, and with this document, I'm using this left column as kind of like you know a table of contents. And if we look at the previous um, skills-based resume, I'm using these headings in the middle as my organizing table of contents. You see, so everything here is symmetrical around the middle, but with this experience resume everything is organized around the topics on the left column and I, again no one format is right but by creating two documents that look this these two different ways it gives you options that's the reason why I want you to make two of them using these templates um, because it gives you some different you uh, gives you variety for your resume documents and then you can then tinker with and continue to edit them further um, before you begin sending them out professionally and you get to choose which way that you like best uh, so objective again to plan create and manage technical writing needs within a team at an enterprise IT firm give some specifics related to the types of jobs you're applying for now something different that I did here is I included more information about uh, the Bachelor of Science in Professional Technical Writing. Uh, for this, for George P. Burdell, I said the major GPA as well as the overall GPA. The reason I did that is that you know some folks may have a really great GPA for all their major classes, but their overall GPA may not be as strong. So by including both, it allows you to show off that, hey, I am really serious about professional technical writing, for example, um, but I'm also, you know, an all right student, you know, 3.5 is not bad. Um, so it, this is a way like you're, you're being truthful and honest, but you're also highlighting information that is relevant to you getting the type of job you're applying for. Now, after education, because again, I'm assuming that uh, George P. Burdell here doesn't have a lot of work experience. The experience part of this resume focuses on the courses that he's taken in the major. And so here, specialized communications for technology students, which you all are taking right now, introduction to language and technology, writing with new media, digital storytelling, professional editing and revising, information architecture, research and documentation in the information age, planning and testing user documents. What's great about including all these different course titles, which they need to be accurate, make sure you use the exact names that are in the college catalog or what you see on your uh, transcript. Um, of course, make sure you're not truncating names. You need to spell things out. Uh, like uh, your resume may say like spec com for tech students, for example. Make sure you spell it out, Techno specialized communications for technology students. But all of these things actually act as key words. So whenever the computer that you know, is you know, used by a company to scan your resume scans all this stuff into their database, these things, these different words inside your resume, like new media, digital storytelling, for example, will be things that are serve as keywords for a hiring manager to help sort through the 100, 200, 1,000 applicants they may have for a job. So this is actually a strategic way to help add some key words that are relevant to the jobs you're applying for by simply listing the classes that are in the field that you've taken. Now you don't want to include classes here that are not relevant, uh, but let's say you are a professional technical writing student and your specialization was um, say chemistry. Well, your specialized courses, you might want to include some of those chemistry classes, at least those that are maybe the more advanced or those or like you know, to show that you've taken 
a certain number of chemistry classes because if you're applying for a job at you know, a firm that works with chemicals as a technical writer, well, you need to be able to signal to them that you have a lot of chemistry experience, that they're not wanting a general technical writer. They're wanting a technical writer that knows chemistry. And that's the whole reason why we have these specializations for uh, technical writing at City Tech. So you may also want to include specialized courses that are in the chemistry field that you've taken. Uh, and you could even include a line in education, uh, like after your GP, like go skip to the next line and say specialized in chemistry, specialized in physics, specialized in uh, CIS, whatever it might be, so that you're including more information that's relevant to you getting the job that you want. Now, this may be something you, you at this point might not include in your resume, but I included it here just as an example of something you can put. So George P. Burdell doesn't have a lot of work experience in the field yet, but here is a project for real client. And so in this case, led a team of four technical communication undergraduates to edit our technical report for the nonprofit computer recycling initiative. So depending on what classes you've taken in the PTW program or uh, maybe volunteer experience you've had or part-time work you've had, you may have been able to work on a project either for a company or for a client of that company. And as long as it's you know, approved for you to mention that you've done this, um, you could include something like this in your resume for this project, for the experience resume. Because again, the idea is to show off some work, some experience that you've had relevant to the type of job you're applying for then here you can see the work history this is a lot bigger section than it is here which I call, called employment history see there's only three little lines here this is like one two three four five six seven eight nine I mean a bunch of lines here just for work history and so here what's different is I actually included some of the work that George P. Burdell was responsible for at these different positions so the title for each is what is the actual job title so you need to make sure you know your job titles and include that on your job application database document that you've created put the job title give the company name you worked at give the city and state of uh, of that company where you worked and then what years you worked there uh, and then in bullet points say like maybe two bullet points for each job three bullet points maximum uh, depending on how much space you have but make sure whatever you put here is somewhat relevant to the job that you're applying for or that shows you in a positive light maybe that you worked on a team uh, that you've had communication experience um, you've had responsibilities whatever it might be but the things that are most positive um, if if the work that you had to do, like I'm sure that you're going to recognize there's some work you're going to have in your past work experience that is more important than other aspects of it. So like let's say you have, have retail experience. If you were responsible for counting money, doing receipts, uh, making bank deposits, that's more important than you know, sweeping the floor and taking out the trash, which you wouldn't want to include. But the more important things you may want to include as a way to show that you had responsibility, which that in itself can go a long way um, when you don't have a lot of work experience yet. Um, and again, you don't have to include a subject. You don't say I. You just begin with the verb in the past tense, resolved, internet, and computer-related problems, created, web-based. I'm going to give you a list of action verbs uh, that you can draw on and of course you can do a Google search and find a lot more of these than what I can give you um, but I'll at least give you some to get started with that'll help you think of the types of verbs that you want to use to lead off these uh, points about your experience and capabilities uh, then after the work history uh, special qualifications and honors uh, so here's like a leadership position that George P. Burdell had uh, again, title, organization, years. 
because this organization doesn't have a place, I didn't include a place. Um, again, lead with verbs, led, collaborated, uh, Eagle Scout, Boy Scouts of America, what date did Burdell earn his Eagle Scout award? And then I included something that Burdell did as his main, because with an Eagle Scout, uh, you have to you uh, design and implement uh, a big type of volunteer um, project. And so in this case, I, I explained what he did. He designed it, he acquired the donation materials, and managed construction to a deadline. So again, these things point to him having responsibility, to having professionalism, that he met a deadline, all this kind of stuff. And then references at the very end. And here you can see a different way of organizing the references. And I used a hanging indent, you know, like you know, an MLA style that you would have used, like maybe in English 1101, 1121, a hanging indent to, to separate the three different references, leading off with a name, title, where they work, phone number, email address, name, job title, and, uh, company, address, phone number, email address, um, name, title, pastor, church, address, phone number, email address. So you want to include this information and again make sure you have like some acknowledgement permission from your references to include them and they will give you a good reference. All right, so what I want to do uh, on our Open Lab site, um, underneath uh, this week's uh, lecture, is I will include links for the list of action verbs. Uh, I'm also going to include this link uh, and some others for resumes, but this one gives you, if you scroll to the very bottom of it, uh, different types of task that are relevant for different types of positions. And that can be useful for you to think about like what kinds of responsibilities you might have had at past jobs that you might have forgotten about. I and mean, that's totally understandable. We don't think about this stuff all the time. Uh, so we're having to rack our brain now uh, to make sure we get all this written down into that job application database document that you keep for yourself. You never, you don't have to share that with me but that's going to help you create your resumes which you will be turning into me at the conclusion of this project. So I'm going to give you links to those and I'm also going to give you links to these sample documents both the samples as well as um, these templates that you can just fill out as a way to begin your resumes. Uh, again, you want to modify them based on what you want to include. Now, these uh, templates that I'm going to give you links to, I created these in Microsoft Word, but you can see here I'm in LibreOffice. And so one of the things you need to keep in mind is because I've used tables, you see you have these black lines. Well, remember over here there are no table lines, are there, right? Make sure that when you use my templates that you remove um, the table lines, the border lines on the table. Now in LibreOffice this is easy to do. You select the table. See I've selected the whole table here. Everything's highlighted. And then when I do that at the bottom of LibreOffice it gives me a lot of different tools. And one of them is this one right here for borders. And so I can click on that and one of the options here, actually I need to move this up just a little so you can see it better. I have this option for no borders. Click that. And you see the lines are kind of grayed out, but whenever I were to output this uh, as a PDF, the border lines will be invisible. Uh, and you can use Google to help you figure out how to remove border lines on Microsoft Word how to remove borderlines on Google Docs, how to remove borderlines on Apple Pages, or any other word processor that you might be using. That's something that is your responsibility to do. Um, it's relatively easy to figure out with some simple Google searches, maybe looking on YouTube. Um, and if you really can't find a solution, you need to contact me. But one of the things that I want to encourage you all to do is try to find solutions on your own 
this kind of mindset of being a problem solver is absolutely uh, necessary in today's workplace um, where you know, employers are looking for people that not only know how to do work but if they're confronted with a challenge they're not going to be crying in the corner or you know, begging for help uh, the expectation when you're in the workplace is that you've been hired to fulfill certain roles and it's up to you to figure out how to fulfill whatever tasks you've been given to complete because your being hired assumes that you can fulfill those tasks. But obviously there's going to be a lot of things that you might not know how to do. And in some cases you might be able to like ask a fellow employee for help. But the more that you can do on your own, the more that you figure out on your own with the vast wealth of resources that we have available to us now with the internet, uh, obviously is going to make you look a lot better than if you were to go to your, like say your manager who told you to f complete a task by the end, of the end of the day, but then you show up five minutes before closing and say, I, I don't know how to do this. That's not going to be the kind of thing that keeps you employed there very long. So I want you to use this as an opportunity to begin you know, using these tools and resources we all have available to us online to find solutions. Uh, but if you're really like in a tight spot and you can't figure it out, obviously you can reach out to me by email. Again, jls at citytech.cuny.edu or come to my office hours. Um, but overall, as we move through the semester, you need to be working toward uh, being a problem solver where you find solutions on your own and and not be totally reliant on asking someone particularly a superior in the workplace so for this week what your your objective for homework is going to be to write these two resumes you should have all the stuff already in your job application uh, database that you began working on after my week two lecture with that information, you can begin copying and pasting things into the, the sample resumes and playing with those documents. And then as you do that, you'll probably think of other things that you can add. And as you add things to the, the, the resumes, make sure you also copy those things back into your job application database document so that you have another place that these things are saved that you can then copy and paste again in the future for other documents that you might create, resumes you might create, applications you fill out. Now you're going to hold on to those documents until we get to peer review uh, the week after next. Okay, So you won't be giving these resumes to me yet. Of course if you want me to look at them you can email them to me and I can give you some early feedback on them. We can talk about them during office hours. It would be a great way to use office hour time. Um, but I'm not going to collect them yet. I'm going to have you save them. Uh, next week we're going to have you begin working on the job application cover letters and the LinkedIn.com profile. And then after you've created all of these documents, then we'll do peer review on them the week after next. Um, and then after peer review, you revise them and then you're going to turn them in for me to grade them. Okay, so that's again kind of an overview of where we're at and what we have coming up. So that's the homework that you have. Now you also have a weekly writing assignment. And this weekly writing assignment is going to help set us up for some of the work you're going to be doing next week. So it's very important you do this weekly writing assignment now. Um, so what I want you to do is sign up if you don't already have one. I want you to sign up for a New York Public Library card and you can do this online. You don't have to go to the branches to set this up right now because of the pandemic. Though for those branches that are open you can do that if you would prefer to. I'm not saying you can't. Um, but if you already have a New York Public Library card uh, you should have a library card and you should have set it up with a PIN number. Uh, if you don't remember what that PIN number is, you may need to get, you know, maybe call your local New York Public Library branch to get some help with uh, finding out what that PIN number is because you need the PIN number to access their online resources that we're going to make use of uh, for this week's weekly writing assignment. And again, just like I said before, everything that we're using in the class, uh, I want to be high quality materials that you don't have to pay for, that are freely available 
uh, with the right connections, whether it be because you are a student at City Tech uh, or because you are you know, someone who lives in New York City and has access to the New York Public Library. Uh, because this is a really great thing I'm about to show you how to use that you can access for free just because you have a New York Public Library card, which again is also free. Um, whereas if you didn't have it, this would be a resource that would cost you 25 bucks a month uh, for a monthly subscription. So what I want you to do is after you've signed up for your New York Public Library card, uh, I want you to do, 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 let's see, I'm actually already logged in here, so let me go back out. And what I'm going to do is give you a link to this resource um, for what's called LinkedIn Learning. Okay. Now, if you look at the URL here, you can see that this is actually uh, LinkedIn.com slash learning login go NYPL. That's because this is a special link from the New York Public Library um, that allows you to access what's called LinkedIn Learning. This used to be called Lynda.com back in the day. Uh, and this was a resource, Lynda.com, that the New York Public Library pays for for all of its patrons to access for free online. Uh, because LinkedIn bought lynda.com, they rebranded it as LinkedIn Learning. Um, and this is something, again, that you ha you'd otherwise have to pay for, but because you have a New York Public Library card, you can access it for free. Uh, and again, your New York Public Library card, I'll give you a link here so that you can apply for a library card online. You click Get Started. Uh, and if you already have a library card, I mean, obviously just use it. You already have your library card number and your PIN number that you can access, use for this. All right, so what I want to do is I want to give you a link to this page here uh, that's in the New York Public Library Articles and Databases catalog. Uh, if you scroll down, you're going to see there's this link here for LinkedIn Learning. It describes what it is, and it's, you see in this box here, library card required just meaning that you have to have a New York Public Library card to access this. Uh, so one thing I should point out is like if you don't have a library card you need to do that as soon as you've heard this lecture. Go ahead and sign up for that library card you have, so you'll have access to it. And if someone has trouble signing up for that, let me know what happens and you know um, who you might have spoken with because like obviously again I want you to be a problem solver how can you get this to work for you so if you have a trouble you have trouble signing up for it online there's contact information on the New York Public Library's website so you can call like you know, one of the branches and talk to someone so I'm not asking you at this point because of the pandemic to have to go up to one of these uh, library branches but again work the problem find out what you can then let me know and then maybe together we'll be able to figure out a solution for you. But hopefully you either already have a New York Public Library card or you can sign up for one without any trouble. Now, so here I am, I'm gonna send you a link to this or give you a link to this on our Open Lab site for the weekly writing assignment. Uh, you'll click on LinkedIn Learning. That's going to bring you to this page here. Your library invites you to LinkedIn Learning and you click on Get Started. And on the next page, it's going to ask you for your library card number and PIN number. And so you'll use your library card number and the PIN number you set up for it to log into LinkedIn Learning. Uh, and so you can see here, I, I, it doesn't show me a whole lot of stuff right away. But if we were to click on Browse, this loads up all of these different online courses that you're able to access for free. Now, what's really great about this is like if there's anything that you want to learn how to do that maybe you haven't had an opportunity to learn in your classes at City Tech, or maybe it's something you want to learn to help you in the current job that you have, or learn extra skills that you might be able to supplement your degree with, whether it be like video production, uh, other types of you know, specialized you know, technical communication skills using specialized software. Here on LinkedIn Learning, you have access to courses you can take 
um, free of charge. They're all video based. You make notes and then you, some of them offer you certifications uh, that you can then put onto the LinkedIn.com um, profile that you're going to be creating for part of this class assignment for this project, the job application portfolio assignment. Um, so that's something you can think about as another way to use this resource that you have for free with a New York Public Library card. Now you can see here I'm in the business section and there's, I mean these are just the things that show at the top. You can actually click show all for each of these and find out even more. Um, this is all the different business things, everything from business analysis, finance and accounting, marketing, professional development, sales, etc. We can click on creative, 3D modeling, uh, 3D animation, audio and music production, graphic design, motion graphics, photography. And what's great about all these courses that they offer is that they offer things that are in different levels. So you can start out with a course that's for beginners. After you complete that, you will know enough to then take one for like an intermediate level. And then you can advance to one that's like for more advanced or experts. Or if you already know a lot, say about photography, you can jump right into one of the more advanced courses. Um, but you can see here for like web design, user experience, like UX design. These are a lot of things that are related to technical writing that are offered for free to, that you can supplement what you already know and what you will be learning as a student in the PTW program for those of you that are in it uh, here at City Tech. Um, I can go to technology. Uh, cloud computing, data science, database management, IT help desk, uh, software development. You want to learn how to program or use a different programming language than you than one you already know you can take one of these classes here uh, security network and systems administration web development uh, for software like you can look uh, specifically for different programming languages uh, different computing platforms like Linux uh, so I mean all this different stuff is built into LinkedIn learning uh, com or LinkedIn learning rather not LinkedIn learning com now for the weekly writing assignment, what I want you to do is explore it. I want you to type in things in the search for skills, subjects, or software that you might want to know more about. Uh, I want you to use the browse function and click through business and creative and technology to find some of the different um, areas that are available to you. So I'm going to go to technology, for example. How about I go to show all for web development. And the very first one, learning path, become a web developer. So this thing they show the whole course is 20 hours long, but because this is all self-paced, you can begin part of it. And you don't even have to finish the whole thing. You can just learn a little bit and then go do something else. Um, and I just want you to look through all these different things that are available to you and click on some of them. It's like HTML essential training. So this is like website basics. So I cut right there real quick because I don't want their video to cause me to get a copyright strike on uh, this video that I make for you all on and post to, to my YouTube account. But you click on that and immediately will launch into the introductory video for that course. Uh, you'll get to see things and hear the, the professional that's giving the lecture about that and they'll be supplemented with um, transcripts of, of the lecture, uh, assignments, all this kind of stuff to help you learn these different topics. But now if I go to the top, I can also search for stuff. So why don't I type in like technical writing? And lo and behold, I get you know, sorting by best match, technical writing quick start guides, uh, content writing, information design, technical communication, uh, learn API documentation with uh, JSON and XML. Uh, getting started with writing using the role of the technical reviewer and authoring technical books. So all this kind of stuff is available to you. And so for your weekly writing assignment, I want you to get make sure you have a New York Public Library card if you don't already have one. 
go through the links to get into LinkedIn Learning. And one other thing, after you log into LinkedIn Learning uh, with your New York Public Library card, I think it'll probably ask you for some areas of uh, interest you have. Click on three of them and then click continue and that'll take you into it. So don't think that that's, that'll throw things off. Just click three things, continue, and then that'll take you to this part that I'm showing you now. I've already clicked on three different uh, areas that I'm interested in. So you'll log into LinkedIn Learning and I want you to explore it. I want you to type in some things in the search box. I want you to browse it. Watch a couple of the videos that you might find. You don't have to watch the whole thing, just, just a little bit, just to kind of get a taste for like how it works. And then I want you to write a memo of at least 250 words um, that tells me you know, what your exploration was like. What did you find? Uh, maybe something you thought was interesting. What something you might look at again later on your own. Uh, but basically I want you to demonstrate to me in those 250 words, which is like you know, one page double spaced of writing. I want you to demonstrate that you explored LinkedIn Learning and got a little familiar with the way that it works because next week I'm going to assign one of the LinkedIn Learning courses to help you uh, with uh, the next part of the um, job application portfolio, building your LinkedIn.com um, profile page. Uh, which there's a course on here for that. So I want you to look in general on LinkedIn Learning and then I'll tell you specifically next week which course I want you to watch the video on, which isn't very long, but that'll be a supplement to our lecture and, and serve as a reading um, that I could otherwise assign to you. Uh, but instead of a reading, you'll have these videos to watch. Um, so for this week's weekly writing assignment, 250 words describing your exploration of LinkedIn Learning that you can access for free with your New York Public Library card that you may already have or that you sign up for online. Um, all right, so we got that, got that. All right, so again, um, for this week, your weekly writing assignment is is exploring LinkedIn Learning and writing me that 250 word memo, you know, telling me about your exploration, and uh, then your homework is to create those two resumes: the skills resume and the experience resume. Hold on to them, and remember we're going to be using them in just a couple of weeks for peer review. So you got to have them ready, uh, but this also gives you a little bit of elbow room because I'm not going to be looking at them yet uh, so that if you can't get them done right away you do have a little bit extra time right uh, but I don't want you to to just sit around and wait to the last minute to do these things okay because these documents are the basis of this project just to remind you uh, going back over to our syllabus going to the grade distribution Remember that these documents that you're making are worth 25% of your grade. Um, if you were to unfortunately you know, create um, your resumes and your job letter um, and your LinkedIn uh, profile, uh, let's see, um, that are like half-assed, then you're going to get a grade you're not going to be happy with. You really pull out the stop. Show me that you're taking these documents seriously because these are in fact like your future ability to uh, start your career. And so if you get a good foundation with these documents, I guarantee you you're gonna have a much easier time with the job search than if you don't work at creating these kind of documents now because this is a, a essentially a lifelong process of working on and improving these documents so that you know, throughout your work experience, throughout your career, uh, you're going to be able not only to you know, have a job you like, but to have options for later on for whether you get you know, laid off, which happens to a lot of folks, or if you simply want to transition into something different. Uh, but if you don't do this kind of work, it makes the, you know, whether it be something you have to do or something you want to do a lot easier later on. I want to make it easy for you by doing this work now. 
Uh, your future self essentially will thank you, your, your present self for this work if you do it now so that your future self is just better prepared. So um, this, these are the things that we got coming up uh, for this week. Um, the weekly writing assignment is going to be due before our next lecture. And as a reminder, my contact information, again, jls at citytech.cuny.edu. Remember, I have office hours on Wednesdays, 3 to 5. I had office hours the last two weeks. I had students stop by. That was great. I helped them out. Um, you know, I didn't have to do that, but I just, as a reminder, these office hours are for your benefit. Okay, I, I'm here because I want to make sure you're successful and to respond to your questions. So please take advantage of them. Okay, because I mean, that's the only reason that, that I offer them is for you. So office hours are three to five on Wednesdays. If you need to meet outside that time, remember, send me an email, letting me know your availability for like, you know, the next seven days. That gives me uh, a lot of different options to find a time that works for both of us. Okay, so good luck with this work. Um, for those of you that need to do a little catching up, good luck on that as well. I, I know you can do it. Remember though, if you turn in something late, uh, that you send me an email after the fact as well, in addition to asking me beforehand if you can have more time, but afterwards, send me an email letting me know that it's done so that I can go back and check it off because I have already checked off everything for everyone else. Um, stay safe, mask up, get vaccinated. Um, and uh, you know, take care of yourself and your families. And I will be talking with you all again real soon. Take care.